Poverty is a great driver for civil unrest. If I don't have adequate food or if I don't have an adequate you know, amount of money to meet the needs of my family, and you do, then actually that creates tension. Most of the population still depends on subsistence economy of agriculture. Helping them to produce a little bit more is very important. So was this area affected by the genocide also? Yes, this is one of the most affected areas in the country. Even if you are not the direct victim who was killed in the genocide, you also suffered. But we can also you cannot be sitting and, and expect to, to have food come from above or from some, someone else. Let me show you an example of uh, a pineapple which is ready to be harvested. We're two groups of people who, you know, 20 years ago we're, we're warring with each other. Um, suddenly there's peace there because there's enough for everyone to go around. We want to see Rwandan's people to be, to bring the light to other people who are still in the sorrow and darkness. So God is still with us and has been with us always. This world of ours is more beautiful, more complicated, and more inspiring than we could ever imagine. My name is Sanjay, and this is the story of a journey with Adra to serve a hurting world. I've spent the last six months seeing a side of our planet that not many people get to see, witnessing the most incredible challenges and the most extraordinary hope. Together, we've got a chance to impact the world in a whole new way. This is A Closer Walk. On the morning of April 7, 1994, the systematic mass murder of the Tutsi people living in Rwanda began. Within 100 days, one million people were slaughtered. More than 400 people an hour were being killed by a ragtag group of militia known as the Interahamwe. Although the majority of the killing took place in an incredibly short amount of time, the conditions that set the stage for these acts of violence did not happen overnight. Years of political upheaval, social unrest, and poverty created an environment where this kind of atrocity was possible. Rwanda in 1994, during the genocide, was the poorest country in the world. The inter a militia was conformed by almost teenagers with no education, with no other better thing to do than to join them. The climate of the genocide created a very weak community where one group was leading the crimes committed, the, the killings that happened. The tools were poor people that were uh, brainwashed to commit those atrocities. Poverty is a great driver for civil unrest. If I don't have adequate food or if I don't have an adequate you know, amount of money to meet the needs of my family, and you do, then that can create a barrier and a sense of jealousy. And when one particular tribal group is seen to be more prosperous than the others, then actually that creates tension. 
and it ends as uh, ended up as we know in Rwanda as this you know incredible um, human tragedy. But the Rwanda of today is very different from the Rwanda in the years leading up to the genocide. Since 1994 to the present, Rwanda became a reconstruction program that really changed the social elements of the country. And part of this reconstruction has been the creation of cooperative farming groups who pool their resources in order to create more stable sources of income for themselves and in turn their communities. Innocent Musa Biamana took me to see a cooperative of beekeepers who collect honey in the hills of the Namashiki district, a province in western Rwanda. 35 members. Although they have been harvesting honey in these hills for generations, the concept of cooperative farming is a new one. More people invested into the collective means more money can be invested in improving resources and increasing productivity. People often think that uh, you know poverty is about a lack of finances or it's, or it's often associated with ignorance. It, it's usually not ignorance. It's usually a lack of opportunity. And uh, the people themselves know the solutions, but actually they just need the resourcing to be able to create their own solutions. And access to resources is of extreme importance to these beekeepers. Without the additional funds they are able to secure by being a part of the collective, they run the risk of being underprepared to handle the dangerous job of collecting honey. African honeybees, known in the rest of the world as killer bees, are far more dangerous than any other bee on the planet. They are extremely defensive, and if they are disturbed into an attack, it can be deadly for their target. You know, if you look at, at beekeeping, it's an ancient sort of thing that's been there since, you know, time began. A little bit of the technology about how do you improve the hive or how do you improve the construction makes a huge difference in their production. So you can see this increase in production, you know, which is fivefold, tenfold, with, with just a little bit of an increase in science. Most of the population still depends on subsistence economy of agriculture. Helping them to produce a little bit more, it's very important instead of using traditional ways of beekeeping. They're producing twice or three times more because of these technologies that we introduce. It makes a, a big difference for a household. The benefits, because they can get money out of this honey when they sell it off to the communities uh, around them or outside of the sector. These communities are not giving handouts. They, they are understanding their need to organize themselves, to make a plan, and start the plan. Each member of the cooperative has a role that is integral to the success of the group as a whole. Elena Mukabatera is one of the founding members of the co-op and has been elected to a very important position. She is the keeper of the honey. One bucket of the honey can sell in the market for 225,000 Rwandan francs, or $320. Depending on the season and the quality of the honey harvest, Elena can have a large store of buckets in her home, which adds up to a lot of valuable honey. In a community where the average salary is only $52 a month, keeping this honey safe is a big responsibility. Elena takes her role very seriously, and part of her responsibility is to walk the honey back to her home, where she will meet with other members of the cooperative responsible for weighing and accounting for the honey. Rwanda, known as the land of a thousand hills, is a temperate tropical highland with rolling hills and peaceful, serene valleys. But in a country that is about half the size of Pennsylvania, you are never far from its tragic past. So was this area affected by the genocide also? Yes, this is one of the most affected area in the country. A lot of people perished during genocide. I don't have figures, but it is one of the most affected parts 
in the country. It's, it's hard to wrap my mind around it because we're, we're just kind of looking out and it just, it's just so peaceful. Yeah. And there's just, you know, agriculture and yes. it's beautiful and quiet. It's hard to imagine that yeah. genocide was taking place right here. The government has done a lot to make sure that the country is peaceful, to make sure that reconciliation is there, to make sure that people are safe. So were you here yes, in Rwanda during yes, the Yes, yes, I was there. I was 17 years old. It was hard for us to go out, uh, seeing a uh, uh, house burning, seeing uh, uh, people running out of others and killing them, seeing bodies outside. I can't forget because it was my first time to see a person killing another, innocent people. I can't forget. I still keep those memories. The Rwandan genocide was the mass slaughter of as many as one million Tutsis and moderate Hutu sympathizers over the course of 100 days in 1994. It is almost impossible to comprehend the scale of this atrocity, but to get a better understanding of what happened during this time and how something like this was possible, I visited the genocide memorial in Kigali. Even if you are not the direct victim who was killed in the genocide, you also suffered. And, and you have people taken away from you. You have people run out, out to another country. So everybody's affected by this. Uh, atrocities happen in, you know, in both ways. <laughs> Maria Mushiamana is a mother of four who lives in Gishali. Maryam is part of a collective of farmers who grow pineapples to sell in the local markets. Having started with nothing and having built this plantation themselves, they understand the importance of hard work and perseverance. You cannot be sitting and, and expect to, to have food come from above or from some, someone else. So that is the motto, you should work in able to sustain your own life, to sustain your own family, to be able to meet some basic needs of your family. This one is possible through only work. Let me show you an example of uh, a, a pineapple which is ready to be harvested. This one is ready, that one is ready, it can be taken to the market. Whoever thought that pineapples were a medium of, of, of peace, you know, we think of them as a delicious thing to have on a summer's day, but, you know, pineapples bring peace to an area. It's sort of, you know, you, if you read a book about it, people think you were crazy. But, you know, what really happened is that you're bringing food in a sustainable way. So therefore, actually, the sense of urgency and need and desperation is taken out of a community. It's complex, and yet it's not. You know, you think we plant pineapples and then it ends up with strength and community where two groups of people who, you know, 20 years ago were, were warring with each other, um, suddenly there's peace there because there's enough for everyone to go around. How is it? Sweet. Yeah? Can also try. Hmm. Wow, that's good. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> 
Even in the local markets, these pineapples can bring a high price. A regular harvest brings in as much as 600,000 Rwandan francs, or $857 for the cooperative. This provides not only an income for all of the farmers and their families, but also allows them to reinvest some of the profits to help increase productivity. 70% of what they got from, from the harvest goes back to the member of the group. 30% is kept for the cooperative investment. They can expand their work, they can buy more land, and do other many things through the product of their, their, their work. And the amount they have been able to expand is impressive. When they started, they started only with one acre. Now they have a plantation on an area equal to eight acres. You can imagine how, how, how far they have gone with the implementation of their project. From one acre to eight acres, it is wonderful. And really, really, that shows that people, while trained, they can go very far than than expected. So they are now expanding. As you can see, it is. If you come next year, they will have. A, all, all this place will be full of pineapples on their own land. And this is all made possible from that first piece that from, they were from, renting. From that first piece. They got, they harvest, and then after harvesting, the money they got, they now thought of about buying their own land. So there's this process of reinvesting the actually, money that they get to, to just expand. To expand the land. That's great. And now they're looking at growing pineapple plantations, which actually is bringing income to the family and income to the community in a sustainable way, which allows the community to take on loans, which allows the community to do development of maybe building a clinic, of a road, of, of, of other things that actually add value. And uh, in doing that and establishing that self-sustainability of the community, what you are also doing is you're building a sense of security. But in order for these co-ops to continue to keep peace and security within the society, they have to be successful. In some ways, the security of the nation depends on these community movements of cooperative farmers. When the Tutsi-led army regained control of the government in July of 1994 and put an end to the genocide, there were approximately two million Hutus that fled into Zaire, the country along Rwanda's western border, now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Among those that fled were thousands of the inter Ohamwe militia that were responsible for carrying out the brutal killings. It's estimated that as many as 15,000 of these guerrilla soldiers are still living in the jungles along the border of Rwanda, waiting for a moment of weakness to attack. In many ways, the only thing standing between the innocent villagers of Rwanda and another bloody genocide is the success of these cooperative programs that keep the country stable and without conflict. Rwanda has changed dramatically in the last 20 years, from the poorest country on the continent to one of the most progressive. The per capita income has tripled since 1994. But in order to keep the prosperity and prevent another genocide, it's important that the cooperatives continue their work the first years after genocide, it was not too easy for people to cope with the situation. But eventually, the government has worked hard, and other organizations that work for peace and reconciliation, like ADRA, they are working hard into uh, creating that sense that uh, we are together in this. So the whole atmosphere of the country is, is, is different now from what it was 20 years ago. And the development is just a, a, an effect of, of, of that. 
everybody understands that prosperity is a key element to make the country to, to, to be stronger. For you to have unity, for you to have peace, you have to have development. I wish we, when we talk about Rwanda, we will not see only the genocide part. The genocide is a definitely necessary to be remembered, but not to be the center of the things. We are fast to forgive, and we are fast to move forward in understanding that we have to forget the feelings, but not forget what happened. There was a genocide against the Tutsi. This is remembered, but this is not taking me down. I still move forward despite those, those, those circumstances. And I think that that spirit is what makes Rwanda so strong today. Seraphine Mukabatera is another success story from the beekeeping cooperative. She is able to support her family of seven and still have enough extra income to buy their own pig, an impressive accomplishment for a family in a rural farming village. Her son, John Pierre, is growing up in a very different world than the Rwanda of the past. Feeding the family pig may seem like a simple after-school chore, but there's a sense of self-worth and dignity that comes from being able to help take care of the family. Discontentedness is a major factor in social unrest, and a sense of purpose that comes from being able to support yourself builds strong communities. So do you feel that projects like the beekeeping and honey production contribute to that type of stability that would prevent? Yes. We make sure when we are, we are addressing people, when we are working with people, that people are not conflicting. And when you are working with people over there, there's no division anymore. You could not know this is the what or this is what. We, we only know that they are Gwandis. Are you hopeful that that type of massacre and genocide isn't going to happen again? Never again, never again. When you see the situation now, post-genocide period, and the situation before genocide period, it is different. You don't depend on, on handouts from other people. You don't depend on projects that come here and do everything for you. You actually look for a solution. And if you don't have those projects or if you don't have that, those funding, fundings coming from outside, you still have the ability of looking for your own uh, alternatives. The lives of people in Rwanda are changing in a very real way. Their fertile land has provided an incredible opportunity for growth. The babies born in Rwanda today have a chance for very different lives than their parents and grandparents. Although they will never be far from their tragic past, there is hope in this place that has so much promise. You see when people, when they see you coming to them, they, they see you that you are bringing hope. We are bringing to those people education. We are bringing to those people livelihood. We are bringing to those people health. So all, all, all sorts of things for people, they know something is going to happen really in their life. So I feel really proud and happy to be part of that. I like to see the communities, the community members improving to see the success. I see families improving, even uh, the way they, they think. I see some of them thinking beyond the way they, they have been thinking before we, we start working with them. Uh, trying to do something, trying their endeavor, their, their effort to improve on their livelihoods. You know, it's no longer about 
Hutus and Tutsis, you know, it's, it, it's about a community that's come together and has bonded together in its purpose of creating a stronger future and in the benefits of what they've actually been able to generate themselves. And uh, so what you see is you see a stability, you know, not just a financial stability but a political stability and you see a unity where unity perhaps did not always exist within that community. When you are involved directly in the community work or you're involved helping the ones in need, you are working towards some sort of uh, completeness. And uh, I believe uh, Rwanda, if they continue with this spirit of integration and the spirit of uh, unity, uh, you can see a lot more and you, you are going to be very impressed with Rwanda in a couple of years. God has enabled us to, to come out from the genocide to Moment like this where people can still stay together so God is still with us and he has been with us always. We want to see Rwandan's people to be to bring the light to other people who are still in the sorrow and darkness. You can still achieve things no matter what you have been passing through. What was the situation we were in in the past? You have the present to change your life and to to progress, to achieve more.